Hi, and uh, welcome to this presentation at the, at the uh, South Bro Senior Center, and thanks to the Senior Center for inviting me to come back. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell, so everybody gets to kind of do what they really like, and I really like this. Our, our, we, have, uh, we have one office with about 20 people right in Westboro, and uh, 40 in Worcester, and 10 in Boston. So, I do four of these presentations every year. Uh, in the spring, I try to do more general ones, and in the fall, I try to do more specific ones. This is a specific one, but it relates to um, the question that I get inevitably from just about every person who comes in who is doing estate planning, who is a senior, and they say, I'm coming in because I really need an irrevocable trust. And I'll say, well, why is that? Well, because everybody's got an irrevocable trust, or I heard that you have to have an irrevocable trust, or there's a whole bunch of reasons. So I figured I would just spend one presentation just talking about these, wh about why it is that people think they need them, why they may not, uh, if they do need them, what needs to be in them, and if, they, and if they've got one and it doesn't currently work right, how they can change them, because you can actually change an irrevocable trust. Who knew? So I, if folks who, for folks who have been here before, I always talk about my friends uh, Frank and Mary and their, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., uh, and I always say that their goal is to live in their house until they die and, and they want to be buried in the backyard and leave everything to their kids. Today, though, we're, we're, we're uh, going to talk a lot about Mary uh, because at this point, Frank is a memory. Frank's a picture on the wall. He died. So now she's trying to figure out uh, what she needs to do. She's older. She's about 80. And she's concerned about um, staying at home until she dies and being buried in the backyard and leaving as much as possible to Peter and Paul and Mary Jr. But what that's going to mean uh, if she has these assets, and, and here are her assets. So she owns a house, doesn't have a really big house, it's worth 400,000. She has an IRA worth 200,000. She has other cash or cash equivalents worth another 200,000. So she's got total assets of $800,000. She's living on Social Security at $2,000 a month. So she's not like flush, but she's doing okay, right? She's doing okay. She, you know, she's paying her bills. As long as she doesn't end up getting hit, needing a lot of care at home, or needing to go to a nursing home because her health has really deteriorated, she's going to be okay. But she worries about those things. She worries about going to a nursing home. Everybody does. No one wants to. No one wants to, right? But her real goal is to make sure if for some reason she has to, or as I say, if she, has to, she needs to stay home, because there, is a, there are a lot of programs available to folks who want to just stay home if they can, if they, with a lot of home care to avoid nursing home care, but that's very expensive too. So she's trying to figure out um, how to deal with this. And, she, and what she thinks would happen in her asset situation uh, if she went into a nursing home is this. She's thinking, well, the nursing home is going to cost me about $12,000 a month or about $144,000 a year. My income, remember, is $2,000 a month, so that's $24,000 a year. Which means if she goes to the nursing home, she's thinking, God, I'm going to lose $120,000 a year. That's going to be my burn rate, the rate at which my savings or other assets are going to evaporate. After five years of $120,000 a year, out of my assets that were worth $800,000, I'm really going to only have $200,000 left. If I die the day after the fifth anniversary that I started when I did this, there's going to be very little left to leave to my kids. So before we go further, I just want to talk about what would really happen in this case as opposed to what Mary thinks would happen. What would really happen is this. Mary would start off by, if she would want to qualify for MassHealth. Uh, MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. If once you've qualified for MassHealth uh, and you qualify based on in a certain asset criterion, but once you've qualified, all your income goes to the nursing home and MassHealth pays the rest. So, um, if, if you are applying for MassHealth and you tell MassHealth that you intend to return home, no matter how sick you are, no matter if there's no chance that you're going to return home, the home is not a countable asset. So you can qualify for MassHealth and the home doesn't count. Um, Mary can take her money, that other $400,000, and do one of two things with it. She can put the money into something called a D4C pooled trust. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a D4C pooled trust. 
That's uh, zero <laughs> people who are here. So uh, th this, these are really important to know about, and I'm actually going to talk about these at the next seminar, in the second seminar of the series here this fall. A D4C pool trust basically is a trust to which you, you can transfer money uh, at any time, the day before you want to qualify for MassHealth. The money that's in there doesn't count uh, for MassHealth eligibility purposes, and then the money can be used on your behalf while you're alive to supplement your care while you're in a nursing home or while you're at home. Or Mary could buy an annuity. As long as the annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her life expectancy, by buying that annuity, she's also converting her assets from an asset which is countable and therefore making her over asset to an income stream which is not. I'm gonna talk about those also. The, uh, the, in the next seminar, I'm gonna focus on D4C pool trusts and annuities. Um, now, once Mary has done that, she could do this in day one, and day two, she's gonna qualify for MassHealth. She's gonna tell MassHealth she intends to return home. She's gonna have put all of her money above $2,000 into an annuity or a D4C pool trust, and then she'll qualify for MassHealth. Now, MassHealth at that point will put a lien on her assets. They'll say that following her death, MassHealth will wanna be repaid for whatever it is that MassHealth paid on her behalf. So you would say to yourself, well then why would she do this? What's the point? Well the point is, if Mary is on private pay at, a nurse, at this local nursing home, and, and I'm giving you a generic number, $12,000 a month or $144,000 a year, that's not far wrong from the nursing homes that are around here. Um, once she is on MassHealth, that very same bed in that very same nursing home is going to cost her $7,000 a month, not $12,000 a month. So she's going to be, from that point on, paying her monthly income of $2,000 a month to the nursing home. MassHealth will be paying the rest, $5,000 a month. So Mary's new burn rate, if you want to think of it that way, the rate at which Mary's going to have to pay back MassHealth after she dies, is only $5,000 a month or 84,000, that's the seven, seven times 12 is 84, minus 24,000, that's 12 times two, whatever her income is. Her burn rate is only not really $60,000 a month. And, it, and at the end of five years, Mary is only gonna end up paying, counting the income that she paid to the nursing home, and counting, and, and counting this, the, this, the repayment of this lien to MassHealth, $300,000, or 60,000 times five. So Mary, at the end of those five years, is actually going to end up not with only $200,000 worth of assets, but actually with $500,000 worth of assets. So the, the moral of the story is you can always qualify for MassHealth, and it always makes sense to qualify for MassHealth, and we're going to talk about those, those, those mechanisms a little more in the next seminar. But the most important thing to know is things aren't as bad as they seem, even if Mary hasn't done any planning. But suppose Mary does want to save that $300,000. And she says to herself, is there a way that I can make sure, because I feel okay right now, that I can make sure that in the future uh, that I can actually save all of my assets and still qualify for mass health? So if, if she wants to do that, she's got two choices. One is she could get married again. Now, nobody ever takes that option. But I always try to tell people it is an option. The other is that she could give everything away. We're gonna, for, so first of all, while you know, Mary hasn't taken it, I just want to make sure that people are clear why it is that Ma one of Mary's, Mary's best option from this perspective, I don't want to talk about any other perspective, is to get married again. And the reason is, because once again, suppose now she's got a new Frank, Frank number two and they own this house, same house in the IRA and the bank account, they've got those assets, and Mary now needs to go into a nursing home? Well, what Mary can do in that case, Mary would need to show, if she needs to qualify for MassHealth, that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. But Frank can own the house, um, so she can just transfer that to him. He can have other a cash or cash equivalent assets of up to, I put 123,600, this just went up. It's actually 125,400, I think. So it's about 125,000, uh, up to that amount of money. And he can have unlimited income, which, which his, and his income, once Mary has qualified for MassHealth, does not get tapped by MassHealth, doesn't have to get paid to the nursing home. So what Mary can do, 
once she's remarried, even if she remarries the day before she goes into the nursing home. I know that's a kind of a sad thought, but anyway, if she does, then what she can do is she can transfer all those assets to Frank today. And tomorrow, Frank can buy that annuity, thereby converting some of the money from an asset to an income stream. And the day after that, Mary can qualify for Mass Health. And then, as long as Frank changes his will, so as to say that following his death, instead of his assets going to Mary, his assets are going to go in trust for Mary's benefit, through a trust that is part of his will. Nothing irrevocable about it until after he dies. A trust that is part of his will. As long as he does those things, even if he dies and, ha and still has these assets, they're all going to be safe, non-countable and non-leanable, even if Mary is already on Mass Health or needs to qualify for Mass Health later. So one option is to get married, and that's an attractive option. But suppose she doesn't want to do that. Then she has to give things away. She has to give her assets away if she wants them to not count for Mass Health purposes, and she has to wait five years. By the way, there is a, there is a, I'm just going to mention as an aside, there is another benefit that often seniors use, especially when they're in assisted living, if they're kind of before they need nursing home care, uh, if they're veterans, called the Veterans Aid and Attendance Benefit. And that, for that particular benefit, it used to be that you could qualify, even though there was an asset limit, by literally giving your assets away the day before you qualified. That just changed. So if you're a veteran or spouse of a veteran, you should be aware of that. There is now a look back period regarding that program also. It is only three years. There are some other rules that are changing in that program. So talk to somebody about it if that's an issue, okay? So she can give her money away she, to anybody. She could give it to me. I've never had that happen, but she could give it to their lawyer or she could give it to her kids. She could give it to her kids or she could give it to an irrevocable trust. Now, the easiest thing is to give it to her kids. She can just give assets to her kids. Now remember, um, Peter Paul or Mary Jr. or any one of them. Now, one of, the, we, we, one of the things that we've spoken about here before is, among other things, there is no limit to the amount that you can give a child uh, or anybody else for that matter. There is this myth that there's some kind of $15,000 per year per person limit to how much you can give away, which is relevant as long as you've got a total estate worth more than $11 million. So if you do, then talk to me after the meeting, but if you don't, th then that is irrelevant. You can give away as much as you want, anytime you want, to any one of your kids. So you can just give it away to, to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Now, Mary may not want to do that or may want to pick and choose among what she gives away. If she decides, for example, that she wants to save some of her assets in the event that Mass Health, uh, um, she needs Mass Health, but that she keep, wants to keep some money around, the money she probably wants to keep around is her IRA because in order for her to give away her IRA, she has to cash it in, pay the taxes on it, and then give it away, um, which she probably doesn't want to do. And, and, and if she does that, and remember, she has to do that five years before she needs to qualify for Mass Health. So at that point, she's still feeling good. And she's saying, God, I'm gonna have to take this tax hit for something that may never, I may never need to be protecting this money. So that's how she'd think about that. Uh, also, regarding the house, she may not want to just give away the house to her kids because she's afraid they're going to throw her out. And, and this is a constant worry. <laughs> it comes up a lot. And I have to admit, I have actually seen that happen in two or three cases out of a thousand, you know, that I've done. Um, that, that there ends up being trouble with the parents, or excuse me, with the kids. But usually, um, there is this worry. But, but if she's worried about that, and if she's worried that for the benefit of her kids, she doesn't want to just give her kids the property, because then if they turn around and sell it, unless they're living there, they're going to pay a big capital gains tax. Then what she should do is give them the property, but keep something called a life estate in the property. We've talked about life estates here before. By keeping a life estate, she keeps complete control of the property while she's alive. She also keeps the obligation to pay the taxes and the insurance, etc. But five years after she has transferred that remainder interest, the remaining interest in the property after the life estate. The remainder interest is no longer lienable or countable if Ma Mary needs to qualify for Mass Health. Mass Health would put a lien on her life estate at that point so that if she sold the house while she was alive, there would be some money owed to Mass Health. But as long as she keeps the house until she dies, 
um, at the moment of her death, the lien, the life estate and therefore the lien on it evaporate. So the kids get the property <laughs> um, mass, mass, lien, or mass health lien free. Also, they get a step up in the tax basis of the property. It's, it's kind of like nothing but good in terms of transferring that way. As I mentioned, there is no gift tax. So don't worry about that part. So there may be some considerations, though, that, that keep Mary from doing this, right? That is clearly the easiest thing to do, is just give things to the kids. One, will they give it back? Oh my God, right? And of course, that's the biggest concern. In the back of your mind, you're saying, you know, I really trust my kids, but you know, they could, you know, what, what if there's a problem here, right? Um, second, do they have their own problems? So that even if they wanted to give it back, they couldn't. Do they have a creditor problem? You don't want to give money or an asset to a child uh, who you think whose that asset might get attached by a creditor of theirs. You don't want to give it to the child who may end up with a divorce proceeding and all of a sudden your assets end up being in play uh, with that daughter-in-law that you never liked in the first place and now all of a sudden you know the, there's an issue with the asset. I mean I had this happen um, several years ago. A woman called me who had done this. She had done a transfer of her house to her son kept a life estate, more than five years went by, house was all, that was why she did it, was to protect it for mass health purposes. And now it's all safe and she calls me and says, you know, I just wanted to talk to you. My son just got served with divorce papers. Is this a problem? I said, oh yeah, that's a problem. I said, you're, you know, she was about 80 at that time, so her, re, her life estate was worth about 20% of the value of the property. This is a property in Vineyard Haven and Martha's Vineyard. So the other 80% of the $800,000 house was now going to be part of that divorce, right? So that's a concern, right? You want to weigh that out. Uh, or does one of your children have a disability? You don't want to inadvertently give your child something which causes the child to no longer qualify for mass health because they've got too much in assets or to qualify for SSI or to have an effect if they've got a, uh, if they've got a Section 8 certificate. So there may be reasons why you don't want to give it to the kids or to some of the kids at least, right? Um, in that situation, ideally, you try to give it to the child who doesn't have those vulnerabilities. The, one that you tr the ideal child, the one that you trust, who doesn't have creditor problems and whose marriage is solid. Right? That's the best person to give it to. And remember, you can. You can give it all to one person. Right? And just tell them that when, you know, after you die, you want, if you, the, at, they still have those assets, you expect that that person is going to distribute them among the other brothers and sisters. Right? And there's nothing bad about that for gift tax purposes or anything else. Remember, there is no gift tax, right? But, but you have to have faith in those cases. So the only time that Mary would consider doing an irrevocable trust if she, is if she didn't do any of those things. If she was unmarried, didn't want to get married, right? Didn't want to just give some of her assets to the kids. In that case, one possibility is she could give the assets to the trustee of an irrevocable trust. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who is the legal owner of the property, and a beneficiary. A trustee is, the, is managing the property and deals with the outside world as the legal owner of the property, but for the benefit of these beneficiaries. So she could transfer these properties to the trustee of an irrevocable trust. What is an irrevocable trust? Well, to, excuse me just for a second. I realize, does it tend to be dry here? I know this is the one place that I come inevitably about halfway through the presentation. I'm coughing, you know. Mm -mm. No, everybody's good? No. I just need a big, hum I need a big humidifier. I need a big <laughs> no, <don't. laughs> yeah, yeah, put it on the capital. See how that goes at town meeting. Put that on the capital list. Right. So, so, um, so, so now I'm completely lost. So, irrevocable. So. The, how, what is a gift? If, if I give you, if I give you $100 um, and I tell you tomorrow, oh, I want to take that back, can I? Well, the answer is not if there's been a completed gift. If I gave you the, if I, and what is a completed gift? A gift, in, a gift in which there is donative intent, that is, I intend to make you a gift, not a loan. Um, there is delivery, I gave you what I intended to give you, and there is acceptance. You said you'd take it, right? That's a completed gift. So if Mary has given her assets to one of her kids, then that's a completed gift. 
And if she decides the next day she wants them back and the child doesn't want to give them back, they don't have to, right? They don't have to because legally there was a transfer of the to title to the, to the kids. If, if you, instead of giving things to some, something to your kids, if instead you say, nah, you know, I hate to just give that money to my, my young child or my child who's got an issue right now, but I really do want him to have it. So what I'm going to do is instead, I'm going to create a, a trust, a revocable trust, though, revocable and amendable. I'm going to give this money to a trustee, to somebody for that person's benefit. But I'm going to say, if at any point later I need it, I'm going to get it, be able to get it back. That's what revocability means. I can revoke the trust. I can take the property back, right? An irrevocable trust is one where you can't take the property back. So you've given the money to the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiaries, and you can't get it back. So in, in, as far as mass health is concerned, if you've got an asset that you still have control over and you want to qualify for mass health, then whether it's in your name or it's in a trust name or anybody else's, um, it's still yours, and therefore they're still going to count it, right? So the idea behind a revocable trust was you, you create a trust, typically for the benefit of your kids or of somebody. You put the money in it, you make it irrevocable. You get to the point where as far as mass health is concerned, it's not yours anymore. Now, the main thing to re understand about these trusts is that they have to be more than irrevocable. More than irrevocable. You could have an irrevocable trust and still have all of the assets and it still count. If you put the assets in and it's been less than, even if it's been more than five years, if, it, if, they, if, the, if, if, you, if you still have those assets. Now, how does the court, or how does Mass Health, but especially the court decide um, whether you still have control? Well, you can see there's a lot of legal, I don't want to call it mumbo jumbo, but there's a lot of legal interpretations of that, but it all comes down to that. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Those were actually the words of the judge who did, at the Supreme Judicial Court, who did the first of the decisions dealing with these trusts. This was about 20 years ago here in Massachusetts. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have assets that, for mass health purposes, don't count, even though you still have control over them. So that's the ultimate question. And lawyers, for the last 30 years, as long as I've been doing this, have been trying to kind of thread that needle to figure out, well, what is a trust that you, that you maybe have a little control over so that the assets just don't evaporate on you, right? But don't have so much control over the, over the trust that it still counts. Now, the, 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 the legal or the statutory version of you can't have your cake and eat it too is this. These are actually the words from the federal Medicaid statute. If there are circums any circumstances under which payment from the trust could be made to or for the benefit of the individual, that is Mary, or that is if you're trying to protect assets, you, then those assets count. So whenever you're thinking about a trust provision and trying to decide, well, you know, is this going to give me a problem? You just think about that standard. Or put more simply, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So let me start by saying, so this is an irrevocable trust that we know works. The reason why we know is because this trust went all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court last year. One of my colleagues, a woman named Lisa Neely, actually argued the case to the Supreme Judicial Court. Medicaid said this trust was no good, and the Supreme Judicial Court disagreed. They said, no, this works. If you have a trust with Peter, Paul, and Mary, or and or Mary as the trustees, with Peter, Paul, and or Mary, when I say Mary, Mary Jr. I, sh I should have done that in my slides and I forgot. Mary Jr. as the trustees, and them as the beneficiaries. And when distributions can be made to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. at any time in the discretion of the trustees, while Mary is alive, while Mary is alive, at any time the trustees, or if you name only one of them, can make a distribution to the kids at any time in the trustee's discretion, then even though those beneficiaries could have the right to turn around and give the money back to Mary, give the money back to their mother, right? That trust is still valid. The, finally, the trust says that following Mary's death, all assets will be liquidated, that is turned into money and distributed among the kids. And uh, Mary kept a life estate in the house. So in this particular case, there was this trust the kids were the trustees, the kids were the beneficiaries. 
The kids had the right to make distributions to themselves at any time while Mary was alive. Mary kept a life estate, which is the reason why when Medicaid originally looked at this trust, they said, no, this is too, Mary has too much, it's too clear what's going to happen. If Mary needs money, she's going to tell her kids to distribute some of that money to themselves, right, as beneficiaries, and then turn around and give it back to her. So that's why they said it was invalid. And, and in this case, a superior court agreed, which is why it went all the way up to the Supreme Judicial Court. But the Supreme Judicial Court said no. Said no, in this case, it's the same thing as if Mary had just given the money away, right? If she had just given the money to her kids, they would always have the right to give it back to her. But the point is Mary couldn't make them give it back to her. Similarly, in this case, the trustees make distributions to the kids. The kids have the right to give it back to their mother, right? And they better because their mother's going to haunt them every second, right? But they don't have to. But they don't have to. So that irrevocable trust works. Um, when you're thinking about doing this trust, there are a set of things that you want to think about. First of all, you want to make sure if you're the mother, right? How do I make sure that Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are going to be protected, right? Uh, among other things, um, how do I make sure that the creditors of Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. don't come in and try to grab some of these assets that are in trust? Now, if, if, if one of the, say that the trust uh, names all three trustees, all three kids as the trustees, and says that any one of the trustees could at any time make, any, make a distribution to any one of the beneficiaries. So I'm Peter, and I have the right as a trustee to distribute to myself at any time $100,000. And now my creditor shows up. I've got this creditor who, and my mother didn't know that I had this creditor, and so she did the structured things this way, and now my creditor shows up and gets a claim against me, a judgment, and has the court order me as the trustee because I have the right to do it. I, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the debtor, so I owe this money to this creditor, and the court now has power over me to make sure that I pay my debts. So the court can actually then order me as the trustee to make a distribution to myself of this $100,000 so that the creditor can get paid, right? So how do we avoid that? Well, the, it, the main thing is, or one way is, to cap the amount of distribution that can be made to any one beneficiary in any one year. So that you know that there's this kind of maximum amount of liability. This maximum, this, if this is a problem, there's a maximum to, to how much that problem could be. Another way is to name multiple trustees. To say that in this situation, while distributions can be made to any one of the kids, you have to have at least two trustees authorize the distribution. So if there's a creditor of Peter's who tries suing to get their money, they can force Peter to make a distribution. But if Peter also needs the permission of Paul or Mary Jr., because two trustees have to be able to make that distribution, right? Somebody's got a phone, got to kill that call. Thank you. Um, in that case, we're protected from the creditor. We're also protected from that spouse that we were worried about. If I've, got a, if I've got a spouse of Peter or Paul or Mary Jr. who is going through divorce and says, well, you know, a piece of these assets need to be counted as part of the divorce, right? Because, look, there's this big pile of money. It was your mother's. You're going to be getting it after you die. But the, a legitimate defense in that case, if I were Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr., would be, I can't make a distribution to you. Only I, together with another one of the trustees, can make a distribution to you. And therefore, those assets can't be counted. So the first thing, you want to, Mary wants to protect her kids. The next thing, how do we make sure that we protect Mary? Um, how do we make sure, among other things, if she names one trustee, Peter, and then later on down the line, she needs some of this money, and she says, Peter, I really want you to make a distribution to somebody. What if he says no? Because, of course, that's the issue. He has to have the, it has to be in his discretion. She can't have kept the ability to order a distribution to somebody. It has to be in his discretion. So what if he says no? Well, then Ma's got a real problem, right? So one possibility to, uh, to deal with that would be to say any one of the children has the right to order a distribution. Any one of the beneficiaries has a right to order a distribution out, even if that beneficiary is not one of the trustees. A second way would be to leave Mary, the mother, the ability to change trustees. So if she set the irrevocable trust up, 
She named one of her kids who was the really trusted child, and for some reason it doesn't work out, right? Mary retains the right to, to change that trustee, to eliminate that trustee and to name a new one. And as long as the trustee that she names can't be her, as long as she can't name herself as the trustee, that's all going to work fine. Um, keeping the use of the house. Keeping the use of the house. So we've talked about the fact that um, you, Mary can keep, the, keep a life estate in the house and thereby keep control of the house as long as she's, as long as she's alive. One of the other issues that got discussed in this case last year was whether Mary did something else, whether Mary actually transferred the house to the child, but then kept the right to live in the house, um, rent free, no taxes, no insurance. She can just live in the house. Well, in that case, the court said, well, you know, we're going to we'll say that that doesn't mean that the whole house is countable as an asset but there may be some part of the value of the house that's countable as a result of that. So I think you want to stay away from that. What about the right to trust income? This used to be extremely common, that people would write these trusts um, um, that were income-only trusts. So the mother would give the assets to the, to the, to the kids as, trust, as the trustees, but retain the right to all of the income from the trust during the mother's lifetime. These can be really problematic. Um, so I tell clients, if you, can, if you can at all avoid this, avoid it, right? If you can just let it go and just assume that to the extent that you need regular income, the kids are going to distribute it to themselves and then turn around and give it to you. Because there are questions here about, so what is income and what is principal? For example, suppose I've got all these assets and this is an income only trust, um, but I still have the ability as a trustee to take some of the assets and buy an annuity with it, right? Buy an annuity. Well, an annuity, as we've discussed earlier, is an income stream as far as mass health is concerned. As long as it's not an annuity that you can cash it out and get all the money back, it's an income stream. It's not an asset. So if I took some of that money and turned it into an income stream, I could thereby increase my mother's income. So these are the kinds of problems that you can, you, can, you can end up with if you've got a trust in which the senior has retained the right to the income from the trust. So I would say stay away from them. No loans. This used to be very common. You know, there'd be a, in, a, a trust, you transfer all the assets to the kids in the trust and only the kids are the beneficiaries, but trustee has the power to make loans to anybody, including their mother, right? So now all the assets go into the trust and the mother borrows $100,000 or $200,000 from the trustee, right? Well, the courts have looked at that and they said, no, if, if, you, if, if you've retained the power to borrow the money as the senior and the trustees are your kids, as a practical matter, you still have the money. So stay away from that. Um, this, is a, this, is, um, the power, this, was, this used to be common too, the power to direct the money while you're still alive. So you transfer the money to the trustees but you keep the power to say whether or not any distributions are going to happen out of the trust to your kids, the beneficiaries. So you can pick and choose. This is one that has been challenged. Stay away from this provision. Stay away from this provision. Um, fine, uh, Mary as the trustee. I'm going to put all my assets in trust for the benefit of my kids, but I'm going to stay as the trustee. So I'm going to keep in legal control of everything. No, you don't want to go there. Okay. Um, this is, an, this is, finally, this is an obscure one that came up during that Supreme Judicial Court case that I was talking to you about. Uh, in many of these cases, for tax purposes that I won't go into, um, you would set up a, tr a trust that was irrevocable in which the, the grantor, the person creating the trust, would retain the power to designate and make distributions to a nonprofit organization while they're alive. Well, in the course of this case, as, it, as the case was going up to the Supreme Judicial Court, while it, it wasn't brought up by, the, by Medicaid originally during the case, uh, they pointed out to the Supreme Judicial Court that about 25% of all the nursing homes in Massachusetts are owned by nonprofits, right? Not by for-profits. And so they raised it in this case and they said, well, Judge, it, you know, in, in this case, um, you know, if, if, there was, if there was the ability to give money to a nonprofit organization, Mary could have picked a nursing home that was owned by a nonprofit organization. 
and then she would have been able to pay her bills. And therefore, it could be argued, those assets are still available to Mary. So the court in that case didn't decide the question because MassHealth had not raised this matter originally when the appeal started. And there's a kind of a general rule of appellate practice that you can't end up arguing issues that you didn't bring up on it, that you didn't start out by bringing up on appeal. But it's one of those things that's just kind of out there now. And, I, and we know that MassHealth has been looking at this very carefully. There was just a case about a month ago where Medicaid um, uh, called a house available to the senior because the senior had retained this power to designate a nonprofit organization. And in that case, she was not even in a nursing home that was owned by a nonprofit organization. But Marcel said she could have been, right? So that case is going to go up on appeal. As a matter of fact, I think we're doing that case. It wasn't our, it wasn't our trust. <laughs> but, uh, but that case is going up. So you want to be careful on those. So there are a number of kind of individual uh, um, problems that can occur, right? Oh, and by the way, regarding amendments, right? Re irrevocable trust can be amendable. Many people assume that that's not the case. Irrevocable trust can be amendable as long as you've said in the, in the trust language that you can amend the trust. You just need to make sure that you can't amend it in a way that helps Mary. And Mary can't have the ability to amend the trust or any kind of veto power over the amendment of the trust. Okay? So there are some limitations on what Mary can do. So what if you have a trust already and it's irrevocable? and it's non-amendable, and it's got a problem, and it's got one of these problems. And by the way, that trust, trust that you have that has a problem might have been okay when you did it, right? Because the rules that apply to a trust, assets that are in trust, are the rules that apply when you're applying for mass health, not the rules that applied when you wrote the trust. So the, the rules can actually have changed on you so that while the original trust was fine, now there's a problem. So the question is if you've got one of those what can you do? Um, you can actually amend it. Who knew? You can actually amend an irrevocable or amendable trust. Uh, how is that? Well, it was always the case that a trust that wasn't amendable by the trustees and the beneficiaries was always amendable by the court. So you could always go to court and say to the judge, you know, the circumstances have changed and we need to do this and we need to do that. And so we'd like to amend the trust. And as long as the trustee and the, and the beneficiaries agreed to all of that, usually the court would do that. Well, about three years ago, um, Massachusetts adopted something called the Uniform Probate Code. Um, and under the terms of that probate code, of the Uniform Probate Code, um, if all interested parties assent, and all interested parties are the grantor, the trustee, the beneficiaries, then the trust can be modified without going to court in any way that the court could have modified it. So as a practical matter, there is a device right now through which if you have a trust that you've put property into, maybe five years have gone by or maybe four years and you think your property is almost safe and now you know that there's a problem with that trust, right? If you want to, you can modify that trust without having to first take everything out of trust, right? And you'd say to yourself, well, you know, but why would I do that? If my trust is defective and I do this modification, the modification basically is going to like trigger another five year look back period. Uh, and, the only, and my only answer to that is if you, if you, if you've, the goal of life is to, at our age is to not lose sleep. If you've got a trust that is causing you to lose some sleep, what I would suggest is if you modify it in the way that I just suggested, and five years then go by, then you know that the trust is good. If you modify it in the way that I just suggested, and less than five years go by, you haven't like reversed what you now have. You haven't made whatever you now have invalid, right? You've simply left it where it is. And so at that point, if five years haven't gone by, you're stuck arguing that your old trust is still valid. And it may be. And it may be, this is, there, there are, there, these cases get ambiguous and courts decide different ways and they, they decide different ways over time. So it may be worth, if you think it's appropriate and, you, and, and it's, this thing is causing you to lose some sleep, it may be worth changing the terms of your trust. You can decide that yourself. And regarding any of these trusts, get them checked every five years. 
get them checked. Because, as I say, the rules do change. Several of the limitations regarding <clears throat> irrevocable trusts really weren't there 10 years ago. So you may have done something that all worked then and that may not work now. So if, and if you're concerned about it, you should simply get it checked. Once again, the goal of all of these is to sleep well at night. If you're not concerned about any of these stuff, well, that's okay. If you are concerned about it, I just wanted, you wanted to emphasize, you know, first of all, don't do an irrevocable trust unless you, unless you have to. If you're married, you don't really need to do one. You can usually do something else we, 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 because if one of you needs to qualify for mass health, you can shift assets. You may want to change your wills, but you may not need an irrevocable trust. If you do an irrevocable trust, there are some provisions that you really want to kind of pay attention to to make sure that you don't inadvertently do an irrevocable trust that doesn't work for you. If you've already got an irrevocable trust and you've got concerns about it, you may want to just get it checked. Talk to your lawyer. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Nice to see you. We'll see you in a couple months.